Authors, poets, thinkers, all of you who've joined us here today. This is a very, very special session. And I'm honored and uh, proud to be here in Bhuvaneshwar to uh, meet uh, the power couple, as they called you. And in fact, one of the recent articles, I think, published by New, uh, New Indian Express, called you the Warren Buffett of Orissa. The Warren Buffett of Orissa. So that was another article. I'm which very is... embarrassed <laughs> with a statement like that. And... I think we don't enjoy being called a power couple. I don't know who invented yeah, that. I, I saw your reaction. Um, <laughs> service couple, yes. Power couple, no. Yeah. Service, service couple. couple. Service couple. Yes. So, uh, you know, be before I start this session, I'd, I'd like to read out a tweet that you recently put out. Uh, you're hunting for a CEO of uh, the... This is Fantastic. the world. Fantastic. Please do it. Please do it. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'm reading it out for, yeah. So it's also promoting a tweet uh, if there's anyone here who wants to apply for the job. But uh, the way you put it is the iconic world skill center at Bhavaneshwar needs a visionary CEO, someone who can prove that India can be a leading player in creating a globally admired workforce, must have the capability to lead the most advanced skill center in India, someone with a sense of history. So in this tweet, I sense empathy as well as ambition. I sense an individual effort as well as a collective hope. I sense a heart as well as a mind. So I think this sort of defines who you are as a person. Uh, I've been speaking to people in Orissa and uh, uh, you know, in Delhi and in other parts of the country and globally, you're known, uh, you know, as for your work and mind tree and all of those things. But in Orissa, there is immense relatability to your story. And the fact that you've come back and working with the government gives people, uh, you know, um, it makes people enthusiastic about our systems, sort of uh, re-energizes them and sort of gives them this new hope and faith in our in our government systems and you know as, as we know the lethargy that had set in the cynicism that has set in so it gives a new uh, you know energy it's a rebirth of of a system when people you know come back and join it so um, i welcome you also ma'am uh, you've uh, you, a sahitya academy award winner actually you're the most uh, fit for this uh, stage to, uh, and, and, you carry with you a literary tradition, uh, not just of your mother. In fact, we had uh, interesting discussions on, on this platform about the literary revolution that women led in Orissa. So we're going to touch upon all those topics. First, uh, I'd like both of you to um, tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing with the Orissa government and how the experience has been so far. Thank you for asking uh, this question. Actually, um, I can say for both of us, we are extremely grateful that we have got this platform to do something for the state that, uh, you know, where we were born and uh, the first cry was here, the first laughter was here. We met here, our families are from here. So, you know, our heart beats for Odisha. And after... <laughs> After uh, 40 years, when we decided uh, that we should uh, spend some time in Odisha, and we didn't know how long, and we came here, it was so surprising that uh, within the four uh, within four days of Shibrato having to decide that he will uh, now retire. So we were here and uh, I'm so glad also I got a platform to do what I love to do that is to be with the schools, the education system and books. Um, as you know that uh, I'm with uh, a program, government program called Mo School, Mo meaning mine. So it uh, we have 56,000 schools in Odisha which uh, now we are trying through more school to connect the alumni 
with the schools and the community. So this has uh, really um, revolutionized the way we look at schools in the state. And uh, you will be surprised that uh, out of these 56,000, already 34,000 schools have been touched up. And these are uh, two ways that we are doing. We want the uh, people to uh, get connected to schools and uh, by, you know, uh, one what we call is service. And one we call uh, is, of course, the financial uh, help when someone wants to do something for a school. But it is not a fundraising as such, because we want to show that we are also connected to that school. So someone planning to give X to a particular school for a particular project, we at most school match it with giving two X for the same project for the same school. And uh, uh, within the, we just completed four years and um, we, uh, the volunteers, the people who are connected to the schools have already given 135 crores. So we have, we at Mo School have given a matching amount of 270 crores. So um, I'm very proud of this program and I hope it changes the uh, state of schools in our uh, state. Thank you. Anything else? You yes, want I, I will come back to you. We, yes. can, uh, we can bring him in. Sir, uh, like Sushmita was saying, uh, my retirement lasted four days. Uh, it so happened that in 2016, I stepped down from uh, the company that I co-founded, Mindtree. And uh, it so happened that I was invited by the state government here to deliver a talk. Um, it was 2016, April 2nd. And uh, the talk was to the top uh, bureaucrats of the state. Uh, the forum was called Odisha Knowledge Forum, uh, where uh, people from unusual sources are called in to speak about their life and issues. Um, and um, little did I realize that the Honorable Chief Minister was listening into that conversation. He stays out, out of it so people can have a free flow conversation. So this was April 2nd. April 6th, he called me and said that you should come back to the state and you should work with us and specifically in the area of skill development because uh, you know he was very concerned about uh, creating employable skills for children who drop out of school after fifth eighth or tenth class because of either intellectual reasons or because they simply cannot cope or uh, he, they you know or, or uh, because of uh, any socioeconomic factors. So uh, there was a massive uh, a drive to provide employability skill training for school dropouts and also children who will opt to go to an ITI or a polytechnic as against mainstream, mainstream education. So, um, you know, that was a big, big, uh, big opportunity. It was a call. And like Sushmita was saying, you know, our heart beats for this place because we're born here. I come from a lower middle class family and she comes from a middle class family. We went to government schools. Uh, we were raised by parents who had very little means. And um, we have been very lucky uh, to be where we are today in life. And then we said that this is actually a very, very auspicious thing. And, um, you know, she was not the one who was comfortable with public life. So I asked her first uh, whether, you know, she would support it because this was a time that we could have just chased, you know, our post-retirement dreams and done things to just enjoy life. And uh, she, I remember very clearly, uh, she said that uh, you're born there, you owe it to that land, so go do it. And so I first came. And shortly thereafter, the Honorable Chief Minister asked her to be part of the Mo School uh, initiative. And then, you know, to both of us, I think it has been uh, uh, it has been a once in a lifetime opportunity. And I hope that more people get such opportunities because somebody asked me shortly after I joined the government, uh, you know, how am I surviving? And uh, somebody asked me, so are you all right? You know. Have, have they, are they treating you well and have they chewed you and spat you out as yet? So I told that, um, you know, I 
I was just about 40 days into the system at that time. Uh, no, sorry, four months into that system, into the system. So I said that I won't trade the first 40 years of my life for these four months. So I still feel that way. So, you know, lateral entry, as how they refer to it in, in India, is, is now it's a brilliant new trend where it's, wherein it's, you know, bringing experts and domain experts and all kinds of, you know, people from different, different walks of life into the government. The belief that, you know, if we want to bring change instead of joining, a say, a, an NGO or, you know, doing something for the social sector or working in different silos, come to the government and do whatever you want to at a certain scale. And, and it has a certain, you know, degree of impact. Now, what I want to understand is that, um, you know, mission like skill, skilling, and uh, your, you know, your OSDA is your baby. So we also have a national mission for skilling. So how do the two missions in a state, how do you collaborate? How do you align yourself with, uh, because they, they're both good missions and they're both, you know, intended to do the same thing. So in a state government, how do you um, sort of, uh, you know, innovate your policy and reform your policy in a way that you can take advantage of the, uh, of the national, uh, you know, policy as well? So it is, it is an integrated and collaborative approach. We do not see any dichotomy. Absolutely. Um, there are, uh, you know, I, let me take maybe two minutes. Uh, like she has to sing more school. Let me also sing more skill a little bit. <laughs> Schooling is also connected to skilling. So I'm, I want that collaboration to come out as well. So broadly, you know, we look at uh, two things. One is long-term skill programs. And these are run by ITIs and polytechnics. The ITIs and polytechnics are actually managed by the government of India but they're run by the state governments. They're funded by the state governments and run by the state governments. But they're, they're overall orchestrated by policies of government of India. So it's the same thing. And uh, similarly, if you look at short-term training programs, skill training programs, most of the short-term skill training programs are again joint initiatives by the government of India and state governments. So give me, uh, I mean, to give you a couple of examples, one is a very, celebrated program, very successful program called the Dindyal Upadhyay Gramin Koshala Yojana. The other is the Pradhan Mantri Koshala Vikas Yojana. So these two are taken and then implemented at a state level. How the state implements, there's a lot of flexibility there. The other important thing is while these overarching collaborative platforms exist, states are free to innovate and do things. For example, World Skill Center is not part of things like this. World Skill Center is an iconic skill uh, initiative by the government of Odisha with a sovereign loan from the Asian Development Bank, guaranteed, of course, by the government of India, whereby we are putting in something like close to about 1,300 crores into building a half a million square feet state-of-the-art, super state-of-the-art skill development center in Bhuvaneshwar. So things like these, and there are many such similar innovative efforts, whether it is in terms of girl-child enrollment, for example, for technical education. So those are things uh, in which the state governments can script their own song. And uh, we work together. We do, there's no, no dichotomy between the central and the state government. Collaboration is the way forward because yes. governance matters more, matters, uh, you know, more than government and like policy matters more than politics. We are very good at that as a state. <laughs> we always have been. Yes, yes. Which, which is also, I feel, a smart approach because uh, then that way you can get a lot more work done, and then you're in public service to serve the so serve the public. So uh, the other question I had was, of course, like skilling and schooling have uh, you know a collaboration, and also when you're when you're into skilling, then you align with a lot of different sectors. You can't you know work independently. So how do you connect different departments? Because when you're entering a government system, governments all over the country are. They, you know, they're considered as, you know, far slower than a corporate sector, less competitive. The environment is, there's less incentive to work in the public sector because money is limited. So the how do you sort of incentivize it for people to work in the government sector or the people who are working for you? How do you make it easier? Because you've transitioned yeah. from a corporate, you know, culture to, to this one. Actually, you'll be very surprised that in many ways, I found that the government acts faster than the corporate sector. Oh, wow. You know, uh, and, and I tell you, there are things that the government does, like no corporate sector can do it. So just look can at you, this can simple... Can you give examples and yeah, explain? Yeah, I'll give you the example. You tell me which corporate sector in the history of corporate sectors in the world 
would have been able to handle COVID-19. Nobody would have been able to do it. Nobody. So what I realized after I came into government is that the government likes scale. You talk to government about moving something to go from point A to point B, they are not interested. You talk about moving from point A to point Z, they immediately want to talk about it. Because in the government, you know, unlike the private sector or the corporate sector, in the corporate sector, if you push something, you know, it'll move. A, if you push something by a millimeter, it'll move by an inch. But if you push something in the government, if you can push, that millimeter actually will go a mile long. So the government likes to deal with scale. Government likes to deal with size. Having said that, the government requires the uh, requires for for it to move. Okay, uh, it it requires a much larger sense of purpose. The narrative is important for every government. You can't just say that this is a good thing to do, so let's please do it. What is a larger narrative? Because we have to understand that this is a democracy. People get elected with a certain mandate from the electoral, you know, electoral system. So, and then they wait for another five years before the elections come again. So the larger narrative, as long as it makes sense and there's a scale, nothing beats the government. The second important thing is nobody deals with a disaster like a government does. It's just unbelievable how government can mobilize, whether it is in dealing, it's evacuating a million people 48 hours before a storm or a cyclone, or it is the ability to, in a lockdown, to provide food in the remotest village at the doorstep. Okay? Nobody mobilizes like the government does. So it's a myth that government is slow. It's a myth that government is lethargic. It's a myth that, you know what, the corporate guys are smarter guys. Um, yes, there is certainly a certain amount of agility in the corporate sector, but if you look at the way that the geopolitical situation is unfolding in the whole world, if you look at the challenges of statecraft, you look at the dynamic of the, you know, uh, the, the global political system, you'll find that uh, government is not dumb. Government is smarter than we thought when we went to bed last night. Yeah. You know, uh, I just want to add uh, to what Shubrata said that if the purpose is there and there is a narrative, actually it moves very fast. And, uh, and another thing is how motivated your team is. So uh, I must, uh, I know, I don't know if I can tell here, but I want to tell a two minute story here. So when I joined Mo School, I was told the, uh, the um, people who have funded and uh, there is uh, one school in Malkangiri where um, I was told that uh, a contribution of 200 rupees has come. And that is, of course, the lowest that has come. So um, I just kept it in my mind till I met the uh, district education officer of uh, Malkangiri for a review. And he said, uh, ma'am, do you know that uh, the lowest uh, contribution has come from our district? I said, it has. Uh, uh, so how does it matter? He said, no, you don't know the entire story. I said, uh, what is the story? So he said, no, not one person gave that money. That money has been given by 15 or 20 people. So then he told me the story that there is this poorest of poor area where there is a primary school and the children would go to school every single day but sit on the floor because they are so poor that they, their parents cannot even give um, uh, 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 something to sit on in the school. So the people who were watching around that school, they were also very poor, like the rickshaw pullers, uh, the street uh, hawkers and all that. So they said that, can't we do something? Can't we get a dari for the children to sit? So they found out that the dari cost 600 rupees. And they were very disheartened because they said that 600 rupees is a lot of money. 
So then someone told them about the Mo School program where I said, can you get 200 rupees? Said, yes, we can. So some people gave five rupees, some gave 10, 15, and 200 rupees uh, was, uh, you know, totally, uh, they gave it to us. And instead of giving some 15, 20 names, they just put in one name. And we sent them 400 rupees and the dari was purchased for 600 rupees. <laughs> so... You know, that this story has motivated so many people. And, um, you know, people just, um, this is what the government does. You just need to tell the stories. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. so the, I, I, I think to just add to what Sushmita, you said, uh, you harped on grassroots. Yes. You know, the government goes to yeah. grassroots. If you look at the whole fight against COVID, yeah. on one hand, it was happening in the ICU with the doctors and the nurses. But on the other hand, it was happening at the grassroots by the Asa Didi, the Anganwadi Didi. Yes. What they have done, you know, no, you know, yes. nobody else will do. And nobody else will do. You have to be on the ground to understand where those 200 rupees are coming from and to, yes. and to find out the story yes. behind those 200 rupees. For a big corporate guy, that those 200 rupees is just basically nothing. Like they wouldn't know the, the story behind it, the sociological rea reality behind, behind that money. But so, now that she has told us, so you have to listen to a story from me. It's like more, more skill story. Hard, so one of the things that the government does, like nobody can do, is track down somebody if it actually wants to do it. If the government wants to track you and me down, okay, we are 1.3 billion people. It'll take broadcasted live. So yeah, we, yeah, that's fine. Made it easy that's, for that's them. fine. That's fine. We 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 can do it in fifty. Easy for them to track us down. <laughs> It'll, it'll get done in 10 minutes or less. Okay. So the government wants to know, you know, track so and so person down. And this is not about Big Brother watching. Okay. There's a, there's a nice twist to it. So when I first came uh, and uh, I was visiting skill institutions, I had this formula called 10642. I would go to a skill institution and they were trained to say, we have five acres of land, we have three phase electricity, we have this machine. I'd say, no, 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 no. You tell me 10 names of outstanding students you're proud of. Of those 10 names, you have to tell me names of six kids who have gone outside the state. Of that 10, you have to tell me four names of girls. And you have to tell me two, 10, 6, 4, 2, two names of somebody who has studied here but has not sought a job, but has started a small business somewhere. My whole intent was to push them into celebrating role models. So they were, they went helter skelter. When I would go in and say, so tell me your 10642, then the principal would say, oh, sir, I have only come here four months ago, or say I have only two months to retirement. So no, no, I don't want to hear all that story, 10642. So in that four, in uh, one particular ITI, so the principal was breaking his head. The, the second in command said, sir, I know, I know, I can tell you about one girl who used to study here. Adibasi girl, who today, uh, she's, uh, she is a locomotive pilot. I said, tell me more about it. She says, her name is Muni Tiga. She came from a poor tribal family. This is ITI Burger. And uh, today she hauls the, you know, hauls a train for Indian Railways. So I said, I want to talk to her now. So in exactly under 10 minutes, Muni Tiga was on the phone with me. Okay. So all that has to happen is a collector needs to know that we need to talk to Muni Tiga. The collector will speak to his counterpart, to the collector of other district, the railway PRO will call in, the station master will know. In 10 minutes, Muni Tiga is on the line. So I said, Muni Tiga, and she doesn't know who I am. So I said, so what's the story here? So she says, my name is Muni Tiga. I work for the Indian Railways. And these days I'm posted in Bhuvaneshwar. And then she breaks into Hindi and she says, Main har roj Shatabdi Express ko Bhuvaneshwar se Palasa tak khinch ke leke jati hoon aur wapas leke aati hoon. So, you know, apart from, apart from being grassroots, apart from moving at, you know, gigantic scale, the government can track you down if it wants to.
those are some stories you're collecting in your in your retirement <laughs> during your retirement which retirement that didn't happen so ma'am from you i want to understand uh, two things uh, specifically one is uh, the problem of infrastructure in schooling like you know we see a lot of pictures i mean i'm from delhi there you know the delhi government is doing putting a lot of efforts into reviving the schools and completely and even the skill training the teachers so you know aspects like these uh, what challenges do you see in uh, in the in the schooling sector in in Odisha? What what kind of and what kind of scope do you see when you when you look at these schools when you visit you know the remotest of districts? What what are the problems that are plaguing education here? So the problems are many, and it is uh, not only in Odisha. I would like, I would think that it is there in uh, every state. But, uh, you know, at most school, we first started, uh, uh, you know, to uh, take care of the infrastructure and bring the chil children, the students, um, to be aware of what is happening uh, around the world. So uh, when, we, when we get a successful person who is, say, a scientist uh, in, say, NASA, he or she comes and tells her story. Then the children feel that, uh, okay, this person studied in a school like us, but has gone there. So I can do it. So th that is the uh, motivation that we want to bring. But for, for that, we have to first bring the children to school. So to be able to bring the children to school, we need some kind of an infrastructure. So uh, that is where it all began. But now, of course, during COVID times, we had uh, teacher training and uh, we, are, um, uh, we are trying to um, uh, have so many um, different ways of connecting with the schools. And so that we can help the uh, school and mass education uh, department in uh, further uh, improving the schools. So that is the idea. Uh, another question that actually yeah. I have for you is that a lot of uh, you know old literature from from Orissa is about poverty. It's about tribal life, uh, you know, about hunger, about starvation, but the kind of history that the state has had. You know, place like Kalahandi, we have heard stories not just because they turned out to be political stories, but just you know, so many writers have talked about it. So you know, when you when you took because you are a writer and uh, you also a Sahitya Academy Award winner, and your you know your mother is you know was a famous writer. So do you think that, uh, you know, um, that aspect of your life, somewhere down the line, you kept that in your heart that you want to come back and work for, for people because as a writer, you thought about poverty, thought about, you know, uh, Orissa's problems? You know, I will not go to poverty. You know, Odia literature has been very, very rich. And if you really go back to uh, ancient Odia literature, um, uh, it was not about poverty. Um, uh, it all started like in uh, many other um, uh, any, any other literature it all uh, started with a spiritual bent uh, oh, you are talking about 17th 18th century then you know it was it changed with a writer called upendra bhanja who veered from uh, being about uh, spiritual to uh, you know writing about uh, um, love about uh, about the society you know other things um, other than just about religion and uh, like I said spiritual things so it, there wasn't poverty as such see the problem what I see is uh, Odia literature has not uh, the ancient Odia literature has not been documented well so what we need are three things whether it was, uh, you know, from time immemorial, uh, it has, it should have been documented well. Then Odia literature should have been you know, translated into other languages. And third thing was, you know, we have to, as a society, as a, a state, uh, we have to inculcate the habit of reading. Mm -hmm. So uh, when these three things uh, are there, whether it was, uh, see, now we can again start. And it's not all about poverty that you said. Yeah. So uh, we start, if we start documenting, then you see that the literature is not all about that. It is about many other things also. So well, are there plans to include uh, um, a variety of literature in the curriculums in schools? Um, um, or like, 
से फकीर मोहन सेनापति और गोपो बंधु दास स्टोरीज फ्रॉम यू नो ग्रेट ओडिया थिंकर्स एंड ओडिया रेवोल्यूशनरीज so uh, you know will they, will they be greater focus in yeah. say the more reformed curriculums in the coming so, years yeah in our part of our society even when we were in school we also studied we also grew up uh, reading uh, fucking mohan senapati's short story but uh, after reading one short story by fucking mohan senapati how many people go back to so reading the, the entire, entire yeah. collection so that is what we have to drive so uh, of late what again through most school what we are doing is that uh, the storytelling yeah. the storytelling is something that uh, there are few yeah. people i know who are uh, doc, uh, you know um, um, video uh, recording the uh, stories and uh, then they are planning to uh, you know send it to the schools share with the students and another thing like i said that uh, read, uh, reading habit that has to be inculcated and that is something that i am personally um, uh, very much into it and uh, one thing that i am insisting that we should do in each and every school whether it's a primary school or a high school is to have the best library ever so that library project is something that i am just driving it both uh, personally and uh, through mo school also yeah. so before the 17th and uh, 18th century uh, like long before that kalinga had a rich history of trade with with the sea trade and there was a rich history of merchants and business and it was uh, something that eventually got lost along the way and uh, there's less entrepreneurship and there are you know with the industries like mines are there but like what about the uh, startup culture odisha's entrepreneurship story i want to understand about the, uh, the evolution of that and the future of that from you so that's interesting you know uh, we we were pioneers in maritime trade yes. and uh, thanks for mentioning that uh, you're talking about the sadhavas but more than maritime trade i think it was the way that they traded the word uh, sadhava actually is sadhu comes from the word sadhu i mean the conjoined word and it is about the honest tradesman okay so there are people who uh, not only traded overseas but they connected cultures and they took the spirituality the arts and the crafts of this country all the way to cambodia all the way to indonesia and malaysia and as you said that it kind of receded into the into, into, into oblivion because of the colonial rule and uh, we had a long uh, uh, you know long gap between the Uh, outstanding uh, the the outstanding uh, work of the sadhavas uh, all the way until independence where there was a blackout of entrepreneurship uh, as far as odisha goes but once that was the once the country got independent we started our journey uh, if you ask me to be critical about my state i'll tell you that our problem was that we actually we prayed at the temple of the false god the temple of the false god was that we thought that you know economic transformation will happen if we just build large companies if we build big refineries if we big build big steel plants all automatically there will be generation of entrepreneurship and employment no that didn't happen so we are home today to the largest clusters of steel plants we are home to one of the largest refineries in the country and so on but uh, these do not spur entrepreneurship at the grassroots level and uh, if you compare us with let us say people in the north the ncr region or if you compare ourselves with people in coimbatore or compare ourselves with people in pune or in bangalore it is not a story of large you know thousands of crores of companies these are places which have very successful small and medium enterprises these are places where there's not one big company but thousands of 10 crore 40 crore 50 crore companies these are companies that generate employment now unfortunately what happened is that in our state here doing business was looked down upon so if you if you are a Uh, you know in a in a family if the one brother or sister becomes an entrepreneur 
in the north or down south or the west, uh, that person was not seen as a loser. But in my state for a long period of time, you had seen somebody who was not good at becoming, you know, good at studies, so you couldn't become an IS officer, you couldn't become a doctor, you couldn't become an engineer, you couldn't become a teacher, so now you didn't have anything else to do, you're starting a business. So much so that it was famously said that if in a family one brother is, I'm being, you know, not gender insensitive, but typically a brother, brother join, I mean, starts a business, that brother will be the last one to get married because nobody would give a daughter. Okay, So having come from that kind of a social disapproval, I'll not call it stigma, but disapproval, it is okay to be a lawyer. It's okay to be a homeopathic doctor, but no, it's not okay to be a businessman. And also there was this feeling that businessmen are dirty people, you know, uh, business uh, men or business folks are people who are not clean people. So uh, with this kind of a milieu, the entrepreneurship drive was gone for a long, long period of time. So on one hand, we're building large companies. And on the other hand, you know, the way that we're celebrating the sadhava, even today we do the festival by the river every year. Okay. And the women still, they, they emulate the times past where they are, you know, bidding farewell or they're receiving, want, want to receive the, uh, the, the tradesmen back. But that celebration of the entrepreneurial culture got completely lost. Now the whole situation is changing. It is because the young people in the last five or 10 years, more so five years, not 10 years, are coming in droves and they're saying, no, it is okay to be an entrepreneur. So amazingly today, India has like 60, five or 66 unicorns and four of those 66 unicorns are from Odisha. Okay. And uh, I, every day I meet young uh, Odia men and women, women who are coming in to build uh, startups, which have very strong promise. You know, for example, I, uh, you know, I was delighted to meet a young lady called Nusrat Sangamitra. Uh, Nusrat Sangamitra, came from a tiny village near Charampa, uh, which nobody would have heard of, comes from a lower middle class family, did her chemistry in Utkal University, went and did her PhD in Indian Institute of Science. So a very unlike demographic to say she will be a startup entrepreneur, started a company called Cygenica. She's basically working at making nano devices will penetrate the cell of a cancer afflicted cell, deliver the drug and come out without damaging the cells around. Now, if, 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 yeah, so if Cygenica actually succeeds big time and she has raised venture capital money from Ireland and she's set up a large lab in Pune now, having incubated from here. And when she succeeds, she will be as memorable as a Kiran Majumdar Shaw. So Odia women and Odia young men are coming out in droves to say, no, it is cool to be an entrepreneur. And I'm hoping fervently that in the next five to 10 years, the scenario will change and they will get to, actually they won't wait for somebody to give a daughter or a son in marriage because they'll find their own. So, uh, do you think startups are going to uh, fill that gap between, you know, an employable a young person and, and a job? Which yes, indeed. You know, big... you know, if you look at uh, the global economics, for example, if we take uh, an advanced country, developed country like United States, contrary to popular belief, uh, the Fortune 500 companies don't create jobs. Yeah. If you look at United States of America. Jobs are created by what are called mom and pop shops. So we require a lot more groundswell. Uh, we require companies that will not employ 5,000 people, but companies that will employ five people, then 15 people, then 50, and then 500 people. So those, eco those economic ecosystems become rich where there is a plethora of many small businesses. And we in Odisha need to make way for the small startup entrepreneurs who will then make that ecosystem happen. And that is where the larger job creation will get.
There's a, another tweet that you put out. Uh, so your Twitter is very fascinating. So I picked up a couple of things from there. So you, uh, there's another tweet you put out, which was interesting. That uh, it was a wall that had been defaced. Uh, I think it was uh, the wall of of of, a, of the college that you've studied at. And yes, it, it, yes, it had, yes. It had been defaced with posters, and and you you were questioning, and and, and I think that also got discussed a fair bit. Now uh, you see this trend quite often in you know universities in Delhi and Bombay when they're having in Allahabad and. You know these, you know, even uh, in the heartland, when they're having these student elections, it's it's a very little imagination uh, that you know goes into the, uh, you know, and very uh, the energy is all, it's it is aggression with the way they uh, you know manifest, which manifests on on public property like this, and the issues that student politics raises is again very, uh, you know, there are issues of that they're trying to mirror actual politics, what is going on in parliament, they're trying to mirror that, and it's away from student issues. Now my question is that sort of these people who are you know educated at these institutions the kind of culture that they're getting at these institutions are the same people who who are our youth who are going to you know come forward and you know uh, go into you know startups or you know become entrepreneurs do you think we are giving students the right kind of environment do you think there's uh, because you, you see the culture of the especially in the north i'm from the north i know that the culture in delhi university especially when it comes to elections is absolutely violent it's aggressive you know that the debates are the, there's no academics discussed in any of the narratives that the student political leaders would like to raise so how do you see uh, do you see this as a problem and then how can it be fixed so uh, you know the couple of things one is the tweet that i made was uh, had nothing to do with student election. It was basically, I, I one day, you know, she and I were going past the college where we met for the first time, and we found that all the walls have been defaced by tutorials. You know, X Y Z tutorials. They have plastered the wall with ugly posters, and basically, they know that the student footfall is there, and the students are uh, they 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 need uh, their badly in need of supplemental coaching and their and parents are willing to pay. the same poster over and over yes, again yes, yes. out the wall. Yeah. And then, you know, our hearts actually wrenched and I stopped the car and we took pictures of that and said, how can you do this? If you say that you are a coaching institute, how can you come and disfigure the wall of a college? But this is about a larger issue. The larger issue is uh, how proud are Indians about public space. We are very proud of private space. That same guy's house, if you go to, the TV will be in the right place. It will be the, spotlessly yeah, clean. Everything yes. will be yeah. uh, spotlessly yeah. clean. Yeah. Okay, The drawing room will be very presentable. Yeah. Okay, They'll keep their own house in perfect order. But yeah. they don't think twice before for the sake of business. Yeah. You know, They will do anything. Right, go. They will. It, a, a college, a school, is a temple of learning. As you rightly said, this is where young minds are being actually groomed for the future. So, how can you not stop and say, "I will not vandalize"? Yeah. This is by law a criminal offense to come and vandalize public property. But then, in our country, we have the highest amount of per capita law but the least amount of per capita compliance. Yeah, yeah. And law cannot be a substitute for character. Okay? So this is one part. But coming to the point you made about youth politics and what kind of narrative are we holding up as adults in front of our youth, I think we've got a serious problem. The, uh, as a citizen of this country, you know, when I travel all over the world and come back to my own country, and I say that... Um, you know, uh, are we not a country that is getting obsessed with politics? Okay, yes. Politics is very fundamental. Yeah. Politics is very important. Politics actually creates policy and policy leads to development. But you cannot be always on. You cannot be saying that every day is an election day. And there was a also, time. It's also a yeah. hunt for identity for the students. Like yeah, no, so I was their, coming I, to they that. They draw their identity from, you know, doing So I was like. coming to that. So, uh, this, you know, when you are trying to behave like every day is election day or the pre election day and everybody is on the campaign mode all the time, then you create a sense of aggression. And 
countries that will sustain civilizations that will sustain cannot be aggressive you know not only that yeah so will this aggression leads to a certain amount of mental violence and certain amount of physical violence and i must tell you what makes me distraught is that you talked about poverty a little while ago talking to sushmita you know uh, compared to today we lived in a poorer india but that india was a less violent india violence was an exception not the rule the per capita violence is a really something that every indian needs to worry about every politician at the political party needs to worry about because it is fine it's a free for all thing but you are doing it at what cost and you are delivering today you you are delivering your so called ideology or so called success for today but where will this india be a 100 years and 200 years from now and if you just come and impair the way one generation thinks you are actually disconnecting future generations from civilizationally what you stood for so we need to be very 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 cognizant about that fact absolutely so you know in delhi they, they have something i mean for student elections there's something called the lingdo committee which forbids you know uh, contestants from writing their names on the on the walls or advertising with their names so they will misspell the name but they'll put up the poster and not a single yeah. metro delhi so metro that is, pillar that is, that, not that a single where, wall is there you know spared. yeah that is where law you know law comes in and character ends so by law you you yeah. you don't re, you know you you prevent me from writing my name but you know my I, I, i tamper that law and I dump my character and say so instead of s u b r o t o i will write s u b r a t o but i'll still write and put it out there yeah. this is called trivializing also we indians are great at trivializing things absolutely absolutely so um, you know speaking of since you since you mentioned the college uh, that you both were at uh, i think we can just uh, close this session with a little personal question of how the two of you met jab we met <laughs> jab we met so i was the coolest dude in college okay i had hair on my head okay and i swept her off her feet <laughs> because you know her her wikipedia presence says that she met you at the age of 15 and i think 4 oh years later you got God. married <laughs> well that's true that's true uh, yes uh i was 15 and he was 18 when well we i didn't see her aadhar card okay <laughs> <laughs> technically well, we a minor yeah, we were in college so we met uh, so you you were college at 15 yes um you know um i finished my school at wow. 14 and half oh my god wow so uh, actually if there wasn't uh, 10 plus 2 at that time there was matriculation and i completed my matriculation at 14 and half so i was uh, by 15 i was uh, in bjb college which is here and uh, that time it was uh, intermediate ia so first year i had joined and he was in the final year ba so that's when we met uh then of course he went off to work in delhi and uh, when i went to delhi to study that is when we got married well, i must tell you this met business is a very dicey thing because you know those days met meant that you looked at a girl from about a mile and if the <laughs> eyes met then you had to marry her okay oh, but... <laughs> it, it's not like today so yeah, we have like to... like the american sailors uh, they go out to one dance and look at that girl there i'm going to marry her yeah. Yeah, behold and so, so perhaps but, there is some truth to we that we have two daughters and they keep nagging us saying so didn't you go on a date with mom <laughs> date in a place like bhuvaneshwar <laughs> give me a break <laughs> No, you didn't take mom for a movie. What movie? You know, our parents would kill me. Now they have a supari on my head. <laughs> I think some of the poets before us were, were mentioning scenarios like this, where, where you know couples get into troubles, like WhatsApp chats getting read. So how was it back in the day without WhatsApp, without even the cell phones? You without put, phones. You know, without phones. Without even. phones. So letters, maybe letter writing. No, no, no. First, you know, first you waited for the monsoon. you listen to the you know drops of it's rain it's like farming it's like you're waiting for a harvest season or or you you pined you pined and you wrote poems and you you know oh. tuck them under your pillow and we wait it for your time and and then you said sunal see that love look oh wow <laughs>
I'm going to get beaten today at no, home. I can has, see that. Oh, she has talked about libraries and, uh, and reading and poetry, so that's where it all started. Well, I don't know whether it started from there or not. If you're asking me about my writing, then it didn't start then. I was always a reader, but I was more into mathematics, as you can see. I just oh, I love, love, I love mathematics. Wow. I, I became a writer because I... Uh, come from a, a family um, where my mother, both my parents actually used to write and I used to meet all the writers. And then suddenly it just, I just started writing at uh, 21 or 22. I just started writing and things changed till uh, to, um, around 2006 when I wrote a book on cerebral children with cerebral palsy. I felt that uh, literature, my literature has to have a purpose. So whatever I have written since then, it's all issue based and uh, there is no reins and... Um, oh, okay, uh, okay, yeah. okay, okay. So, okay. It, is, <laughs> so it wasn't withdraw. you yeah. who inspired the literature and the poetry. I beg your pardon? I think it wasn't you who inspired the literature and the poetry. Did I? It did not inspire the literature and the poetry. So it I... was not coming out of romance. It was coming out of... Sense of no, having said that, I must tell you my yeah. first uh, short stories I would write, everyone uh, since I was young and my most of my leadership, uh, they said that, and including my mother said, you just write about uh, uh, him. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> or life together. So, that was, I would say that everything in life has been a, a, like a teamwork. Absolutely. Absolutely. What what makes the two of you beautiful is that there's 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 some partnership on so many levels. There's partnership of emotions. No, I think we've been very lucky. Work. On a very serious note, I'm very grateful to be uh, to be to be her husband, to be her friend, to be a partner. And if I were to uh, if I were to come back to this world all over again, then. Um, in whatever form, whatever life form, then I would want her with me. Yeah. That's, that's beautiful. You, you've set a uh, couple goals, as they call it. <laughs> so um, I'm sure there'll be questions from the audience. Can we have questions? There's a lot of hands going up. Uh, the lady over there. Can we get her a mic? Okay, the mic's gone there. Sir, if you can introduce yourself before asking the question. I am Ram Charan Guru. My name is Ram Charan Guru. I am a retired field officer of State Bank of India. I, as a field officer in SBI, have financed very poor boys to start and to manage small business. They take loan, but after a few days, they fail. They, they fail and sil sit silently without repaying the money. In, in your opinion, what is the reason of this? Are they, they lack confidence or it is uh, dishonesty or something else? Sir? I, I thought this is a lit fest and I don't know if you're asking me about banking default, right? Um, uh, I think you should, uh, sir, you should keep Just this. a minute, sir. Just a minute. Not I am not asking you about default. I am asking you about they, they are not having confidence in doing business. Even so let, they me, have money. Let, me, let me ask you this. Let, yes, let me, since you're a banker, let me ask you a counter question. Yes, sir. sir. How, what percentage of startups do you think succeed in the world? What percentage will succeed? Of all the companies that will start, okay, will take that little loan from you. Globally, what percentage Sir, will actually succeed? What's the I, economics? No, I have um, no idea. I, need, I, have no idea. I, I, I am need, not such I, a learned man, sir. I was uh, financing PMRI and SSGs. Sir, so 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 let me tell you, sir, that percentage globally is at best four percent. So ninety-six percent businesses must fail, and only four percent will succeed. So unless the banking system and economic policy allows for that, we will actually be unnecessarily blaming those 96%. Because 
entrepreneurship is not like getting a job and being staying or and staying in that job for the rest of your life entrepreneurship is fraught with risk whether you are starting a pawn shop or you are starting infosys only 4% companies will succeed beyond 5 years so the system has to be good enough resilient enough generous enough to create the pipeline so that despite 96% people failing those 4% would lead to another 4% and lead to another 4% i think the way that we look at entrepreneurship in this country requires a radical rethink we are not as a country we are not pro entrepreneurship as much as some of the other countries are so we need to change the mindset and coming to your thing about however coming to the think about loan default okay i believe that in certain kind of generous sir, sir i am not giving stress on loan default i am giving stress on I, why I'm they sorry, are failing yes. sorry to intervene yeah. but we'll also have to give yeah let's let's, let's get people. some more questions uh, i think we okay. we, we have okay. the answer okay. this one thank okay. you okay. Thank the uh, the lady over there in the first row Uh, hello, sir. Sir, my name is Soumya. I am doing my psychology masters from National Institute of Youth Development, and I am a volunteer for KLF this year. Sir, uh, I listened to both you and Ma'am, and I've already met you before at other places. What I had to ask is, I am doing a subject as we all call arts, and uh, I came from a privileged school in the state capital, and uh, I still face problems as an arts student. so and you talked about how the skill development or whatever the government is pushing for is basically something that that is related to science what i wanted to know is why is it that science is only is the only way to feed people's hunger and is literature or arts that we call an art state only for the rich and privileged as compared to others or for people who couldn't be good enough to do science so why is it that you or the entire government is only pushing science as a form of skill development why can it not be an art subject that is my question thank you i think so, you know the, um, the industry interface for the social scientists it's very difficult to find that industry interface and you know as a sociology graduate i think i have i have the same question because i wondered this many times is that you know after you have a degree like sociology you're sort of in the world wondering okay wait what do i do with this okay i know how to think but what do i do like which government will want my you know style of thinking so i i i know we have limited time all that i'll tell you is that uh, both she and i are students of political science okay so don't lose heart and keep in mind it doesn't matter what your degree is keep in mind always what your purpose and your intent is let me tell you that i am a student of political science but i have spent 40 years of my life in the information technology business i have co-founded a company whose market cap today is 10 billion dollars mindtree employs 23000 people globally and if you have an aadhar card the aadhar card engine was created by mindtree and i studied political science okay so don't get disheartened and let me also tell you that skill development is not about science uh, most of the kids who i touch okay only 20% of my kids will go to an iti or a polytechnic a polytechnic is still got a little bit of stem an iti kid basically learns a skill like becomes a welder an electrician a plumber a carpenter a wall painter a, 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 a basically garment uh, garment maker and so on and so forth but 80% of the kids who are touched by me are school dropouts and they become a whole plethora of things which are not about stem which is not about science and mathematics and stuff like that but that is not the story the narrative has to change your your education has only given you the your ability to learn to learn you are not equal to your education you are not equal to your degree you are not equal to your discipline thank you that one has to learn that the hard way sometimes as one more question can we take another a last question from the audience can i yes namaskar i'm sridhar shastri i'm a lawyer by profession board age 
just uh, spoke from sir incidentally uh, no doubt i have many questions many sharings but i would like to share some of my personal experience today i am a lawyer of repute for last 29 years when i became the lawyer it was the gentleman a closer friend of my father hari har panda who gifted me the black gown for the first time he is none other than the father of madam and sakuntala mausi whom i call they were my family members and the charity begins at home the literary festival this is the literary festival it also begins from home there was a magazine called sucharita that was the identity of women in odisha what i know and sucharita a more parivar it was like a family my father was a well known acclaimed astrologer by that time other than his government service sastri bahu sastri bahu ko ko apan aagya hu silabhadra bado so it's like my family and sucharita has produced another writer my cousin bina pani panda who owns sahitya academy this yes. year yes. i used to read मोज हरकारु पृथ्वी मोज हरकारु पृथ्वी को देखी सुस्मिता बागची को ये जगन्नाथ देश में पुनर्गमन अनेक अनेक धन्यवाद धन्यवाद बहुत लोग जान ना सुस्मिता बागची से जो अति सुंदर बहुटी अच्छी बहुत लोग हम पढ़ी ना मुझे कॉविड पढ़ी थी कि मस ते बारंबार पढ़ी से गोटे लेखा पढ़ी थी अबाउट हिज ड्राइवर how he used to be in his the, in the car of his father official car how he appointed his driver how he taught the children that is lacking now i'm coming down to more school avian i'm part and parcel of this i'm proud to be a student of bjp college as well as government of government high school unit 1 bhuvaneshwar in my time in 1980s it was one of the biggest famous school where i appeared by giving entrance examination most school have done i on behalf of my school would like to bow down before you ma'am and you more <laughs> most school have done why because just in the last week i have opened new classroom that smart classroom which we didn't have even dreamt of ma'am was asking about daily I'm also having some daily connections. Just like I think, sir, ne bola hai, Vivi, vakeel ko yahan thoda bhot piche dekhte hain aur industry karne wale ko. Yahan aur do cheez bhi jode hoye iske saath. Vakeel ko koi ladki nahi deta hai. That is not as a first choice. Vakeel ko koi kiraye pe nahi deta hai. Second choice. Thare vakeel ko koi loan nahi deta hai. And I'm proud to be here that I am a lawyer of repute. now these corporate people are running up to me to take my time by my time that is my achievement so i am really grateful to my school and one small suggestion ma'am as you are here if you can please introduce cbs pattern to most school avijan that will one of the added one because i experienced that mo school sanger jodito achi gata 15 varsha r upar dhari रेगुलर जाऊँगी, सब स्कूल अटेंड करूँगी, एंड आई वुड लाइक टू इनवाइट यू ऑल, हु ओवर देयर इन भूने जो प्लीज कम टू यूनिट वन गवर्नमेंट आई सी एंड सी द ऑडिटोरियम, वन ऑफ द बेस्ट। मो जाइए ची, आई हैव बीन टू यूनिट वन गवर्नमेंट स्कूल, एंड वी विल टॉक अबाउट इट, यू नो इट्स अ वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग थिंग दैट वी हैव आल्सो पुट अक्रॉस टू द स्कूल एंड मास एजुकेशन एंड गोइंग फॉरवर्ड एक्चुअली, वी आर गोइ so it will be our great pleasure if you introduce cbs pattern because school is lacking with children thank you thank you thank giving you me this time so i'd like to close this session and i hope you make this okay this do you have time for one last question sure. please make that a quick one yeah sure Very thank you thank you sir thank you ma'am uh um, so i'm somitri i'm currently working with hsbc and a volunteer here so the question is to you sir we are belong to the state who loves to eat pokhada and sleep in the afternoon and the pandemic is just an add on to it 
to this how would you motivate the current unskilled students as we talked about uh, the skill development so how would you motivate the current unskilled students sir and uh, sir uh, there's a question for ma'am ma'am as this is a lit fest can we hear anything from you a poem or anything from you as well first of all i don't write poetry i write um i write uh, prose i write novels and um, you know i can only tell you one thing that uh, next month uh, mr sarma 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 you know he spoke about uh, sastri mr sastri spoke about uh, mojharkaru prithvi the second part of mojharkaru prithvi is coming out and i'm uh, myself editing the uh, book right now and i'm loving it so i would request you to read it in january and hopefully it should be a sure, 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 sure. thank you sir if you can that's a long question <laughs> i'll have to keep you all night here okay so you have a choice and so you, you take her stage. permission if she says yes i will answer your question so <laughs> sanati you put me in a difficult position <laughs> so we Next can talk time. off off stage okay all thank right. you so much sir ma'am and you made the world such a small place that it's become one large community <laughs> Thank you so much for being so, here. Thank you so much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. You just heard from uh, the power couple and the service couple, as I would like to put it. And uh, we've heard about the path-breaking work that has been that they have been doing in the field of skill education and uh, education uh, in general, and especially bursting many myths about uh, the government and the way it works. So, thank you so much for being here with us and mesmerizing our audience. but uh, before i let you go uh, we have a small uh, ritual of felicitating uh, our speakers so i'd request klf uh, uh, team members the founder and his wife uh, rashmi ranjan pareda and prachi naik to do the honors in felicitating shri shubhrata bagchi and mrs shushmita bagchi come together for a photo up मेरे पास तो कई लाइफ हैं। मुझे लाइफ इंश्योरेंस की क्या जरूरत लेकिन आपके पास तो एक के साथ एल आई सी जिंदगी Excuse me what will you do with your first salary So ladies and gentlemen we have the next session we have uh, Mr Aditya Gadnaik eminent sculptor and director general of the National Gallery of Modern Art from New Delhi and Mr Lalatendu Ratho eminent artist from Odisha